Hi, Brett. Hi, Kristen. Welcome to the Superhuman Mind channel. Hi, good to see you. Good to see you. Today, uh, we were going to talk about per, uh, borderline personality disorder, uh, which is a very often misunderstood condition. Do you want to give kind of a summary of what, what it is? Yeah, so uh, let me give the stereotype. Right? The stereotype is um, that it only sort of afflicts women and that it's um, sort of a case where, where women will cut themselves uh, and, and be really, really, really angry all the time, right? So that's a stereotype. Um, that is actually not, I mean, although those can be features of a borderline personality disorder, uh, it's actually um, much more common to have mood swings, um, but mood swings that are faster than in bipolar. So in bipolar, for instance, uh, if you have uh, bipolar where you have mania and depression, you, uh, you can go for weeks perhaps, uh, yeah. where you're depressed, and then you can go for weeks where you're in a manic phase. Um, and with borderline, it's, it can, the mood can change like mid-sentence. Mm -hmm. uh, like you, could, you might start out happy and end, on, end, be, end up being angry. Um, so that's, that's, the, that's the main characteristic of that, that people have these extreme mood swings that are really, really rabbits. Um, it does, for some people, is so intense that they do resort to, especially teenagers, resort to cutting themselves and, um, or hurting themselves or hip banging, uh, things like that. But, um, but really, sort of in, in more mature adults, it's, uh, it's that kind of extreme mood swing. Uh, and, that, and that can, and it tends to be more between sort of being angry or perhaps upset, hurt, right, um, uh, and being happy. And um, another feature of it is that because of these mood swings uh, and because they tend to take everything very personally, they are having a lot of trouble in relationships. So that is sort of a secondary symptom it's not sort of the main symptom. It's sort of because they have these mood swings and because they take everything very, very personally and, and get easily hurt by other people's re innocent remarks, mm -hmm. they have difficulty maintaining uh, long-term relationships uh, for good reasons because it's really difficult to be in a relationship with a person who is happy, then angry, then upset because you, they thought you hurt them. Uh, and or suspicious because they think that you cheated on them or or whatever. So so I think it's a it's a somewhat misunderstood condition, and I think that a lot of um, people with borderline personality disorder are actually misdiagnosed as uh, having bipolar mm -hmm. um, and being bipolar, and so they mistreat it. Right, so there are there are actually some treatments. Um, the best treatments for uh, borderline is actually cognitive, cognitive behavioral therapy, mm -hmm. but but they're mistreated because uh, it's not clear that the same drugs, like say an antipsychotic drug that you would use uh, for maybe an atypical antipsychotic drug that you might use for people with extreme cases of mania, uh, that that would be very good for a person with with borderline. Mm -hmm. So. So it's important that that you sort of distinguish between bipolar and and borderline personality disorder. And um, with borderline personality disorder, do you tend to see a lot of other disorders occur at the same time, or does it tend to? Yeah, so that I think so. I think that there's definitely sort of the comorbidity in terms of narcissism and um, and borderline. So uh, these are some milder forms of narcissism. So what they share in common with the narcissist is that the narcissist also takes everything personally, right? If it's not admiration, the narcissist also gets upset, upset if, if, if the person is being criticized. 
Um, and so that's so that's that. There are people who also suffer from depression and anxiety or mania and or bi- so bipolar in those cases uh, at the same time as they have the borderline. Um, and there are, of course, it, it, it can really occur with other conditions, really. There are, of course, also people who have psychosis at the same time. Um, but it can, it can also just occur by itself and where people are just being, so they just take comments that other people would consider nothing, um, mm-hmm. very, very personal. So I might say, wow, Christian, that's a really red shirt you're wearing today. And you would get really, really upset with me and not talk to me for weeks or something like that. Mm-hmm. That, that would be a good example of it. Or, um, or any, anything, you know, in a sense, uh, even something that's, so if I said something like what I just said to you, you would take it to be a joke. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's often the, the person with borderline personality disorder will not take things like that as being a joke. They would take it like personality instead. So, um, do you know, do, do, well, we can't mention names, but you, can you think of any people that you know with that condition? Um, I think, I think I have, I had, I have one friend who, um, um, I believe was diagnosed with it and, um, um, and after that, she underwent treatment, and there definitely was a, a marked improvement. Uh, I remember before, before she she had been diagnosed with it, she, um, I mean, she's a very difficult person to have around because it was very yeah. unpre- she's very unpredictable. Um, yeah, unpredictable, what, difficult. Yeah. Yeah, as to what was going to happen, because uh, you never knew if just something would just set her off, um, despite your best intentions. Um, right. And, um, she also, I, I believe she suffered from depression and so she had, she got treatment for both and the depression was, was definitely a, it seemed to be a separate issue. Yeah. Um, but, um, I mean, a- after undergoing therapy, um, o- over time it's, it's, it's improved vastly. I think that, uh, you can still tell, see there's a touch of it. Um, because I think, uh, I think with the, you know, with the behavioral therapy, you have to kind of maintain it, uh, um, yeah. uh, you know, forever. And part of it, part of, part of that therapy is to recognize when you're starting, when your reaction is the result of your disorder and not the rational result of the way that the situation yeah, that's, really is. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, so I you can that, sometimes that see one... her start to start to maybe react and then kind of catch yourself and not. So, yeah. I, so it's definitely a feature you still see, but. Yeah. I mean, so the, the, the reason so many people are misdiagnosed may also be that there's a, a stigma uh, surrounding this, this um, disorder. So because there's this stereotype that it's, it's just women who get a, uh, you know, angry women, uh, right. So, um, what what uh, the old psychoanalyst um, Freud called hysteria, you know, that could almost be like maybe a version of it or something like mm-hmm. that, right? Um, that so there's this stigma surrounding it, uh, so that probably um, prevents some people from diagnosing it because they might not want to tell their client that they have that condition. And so they don't get the perhaps they don't get the right treatment. So it's been proven that talk therapy is not as effective for that condition as cognitive behavioral therapy. But you've got I want to just return to the, what you raised an interesting uh, point actually that goes a little bit beyond just uh, borderline personality disorder, namely that the studies of cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, have been have been proven in many cases to be as effective as medication. Mm. Uh, what's interesting, though, is that those studies, of course, don't they don't take place for years and years and years. Typically, they typically take place for say um, twelve weeks, right, right, or fourteen weeks or something. Um, and so you, yeah, so you have sort of the, the problem. Namely that, yeah, you kind of need to maintain it. Mm-hmm. 
uh, either if you either maybe you can do it yourself or you need to actually keep doing it. And so it's not as time limited as people think it is. Right. Um, but a lot of people will tell you, oh, it's just 14 weeks and then you're done. Uh, no, no, you're not. Um, it, it stops. It will wear off if, mm. if you're not really careful. So, um, so yeah. So that that that, that, that was just an interesting um, comment that's um, that you made there. So, and yeah, I think I think of uh, some people in, in my past who have have been really really difficult, and not always women. Um, and how much do you think um, alcohol plays a role in exacerbating the condition? Because I, I, I've noted that, I, or I noticed that there are a lot of people who, uh, when they start drinking, um, they, they tend to start kind of manifesting symptoms of it. So when they're sober, they're, um, they're, they're, they can be totally pleasant, but uh, something about the intoxicated state makes them... Um, start to be very reactive to things that, uh, which normally would not bother them, or, or their yeah. or their their frame of interpretation t seems to be much more reactive. I think that's right. I think that um, people who have milder forms of it, and so where it perhaps does not reach like a clinical uh, threshold for being diagnosed, mm -hmm. um, maybe they are able to sort of maintain or sort of a, a, a karma state of mind because of they have maybe they have like a strong prefrontal cortex but we also know that alcohol is going to turn off uh parts of the prefrontal cortex mm -hmm. right that's why we make stupid do stupid things when we when we when we are drunk um and so people who have a tendency towards it and who can normally maintain um themselves or they can sort of calm themselves down or maintain the condition they will not be able to when they when they when they get drunk mm -hmm. so so that might be a way to spot people who are sort of just at the sort of not quite at the clinical level but almost at the clinical level mm -hmm. and who just become really difficult when they drink mm -hmm. right so so i think i think that's right and i think that uh, it'd be even worse if they actually are at the clinical level um, for borderline and then drink alcohol because that will probably most likely make it even harder for them to um, be sort of easy to be around, right? You right. can see how it might just be even more difficult, misunderstand even more things. And so alcohol is definitely not a, a good combination. Unfortunately, that's also what they often use to med to self medicate, right? Mm. So, they use alcohol to self medicate. Um, a lot of people do that for various conditions, and um, no, I'm not saying that they necessarily do it all day long. But right. people might go home and drink a lot of alcohol in order to, like, you know, get uh, get away from the anger they're feeling or the hurt that they're feeling, um, and so, so, and then. If they are not alone, that can create some really uncomfortable situations because it can become really, really difficult to be around other people. Right. Yeah. Well, that is an interesting discussion. Yeah. Good to talk to you. It's good to talk to you too. Thanks for watching the YouTube channel. We'll see you next week. See you later.